Engine Quest, your home for new OE type replacement and performance engine parts and cores. For our full line of products, visit enginequest.com or call 1 800 426 8771. Engine Quest, the name you trust for engine parts, cores, and recycling. Hey guys, it's Greg Jones for Engine Builder Magazine. We are inside Promotor Engines in Mooresville, North Carolina. And uh, we locked into a visit with Jim Oberhofer here. He's the crew chief for Clay Milliken's top fuel dragster team. Jim, thanks so much for giving us a little bit of time to chat with you. Absolutely great. Uh, you know, you guys have an engine coming together right behind us here. And uh, just wanted to chat with you a little bit about, you know, your career and uh, your uh, role as a crew chief on Clay Milliken's team. And, uh, talk a little bit about all of that. So if you would, give us a little history of, you know, how you got into the sport and how you got to where you're at. Well, it was basically at birth. My dad, um, he uh, raced in the late 50s and 60s and 70s. In the 60s, he had a, uh, a junior fuel dragster that he raced up in the Northeast and yeah. uh, uh, the New Jersey area, you know, did a lot of racing back then. And then um, the early 70s, he was... Uh, him and uh, some partners of his, they had a uh, front engine top fuel car and eventually a rear engine top fuel car. Yeah. And um, uh, finances basically drove them out of the sport, you know, because it quickly became more of a business than sure. a hobby. Oh, and yeah. Things that they can afford. But um, I, I've grown up around the sport, basically. My, my brother and I um, and my sister, they were... My mom and dad, they were dragging us to races all the time. And oddly enough, when we grew up in New Jersey, we couldn't go to the racetracks in New Jersey because they had a law that you had to be 18 or older to oh, be really? in the pit area. Hmm. So the only time we would uh, go to a race in New Jersey was in English Town. And my poor mother had to sit up in the grandstands with us uh, all day yeah. with these yeah, little yeah. kids waiting for dad's car to run. Yeah. So. We didn't do a lot of racing in New Jersey, but we um, went to Maple Grove, Pennsylvania quite a bit. We were in Epping, New Hampshire a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Butts Creek, you know, down in Maryland. We did some racing out on Long Island as well. So yeah. uh, it was fun back then. We used to get to travel, you know, with, with mom and dad and, and yeah. the rest of the, uh, the team. And, um, you know, dad would have us, you know, wash parts and, and um, to basically keep us out of trouble, yeah, because uh, there was always a good chance that we were going to get into some <laughs> sort of mischief around sure. the racetrack back then. Sure. But, yeah, I, I've grown up around the sport. My mom and dad decided to move to uh, Plano, Texas, north of Dallas, back in late '77, and um, while he didn't have a, a, a car anymore, um, he was still involved. The, the Blue Max Funny Car was based out in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, my dad back then worked at Chaparral Trailers, painting trailers, and that was the trailer manufacturer back then for everybody to get a new trailer from. Yeah. So we were still kind of involved, um, but in um, the early 80s, my dad took us, uh, my brother and I, to the Cajun Nationals down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I uh, was fortunate enough I met Connie and Scott Coletta down mm -hmm. there. My dad. Uh, knew them and knew their yeah. crew chief Ron Barrow very well, and um, boy, I was I was hooked again, wanting to work on these cars. And you know, I was 15, 16, and and um, uh, my dad had us washing parts for Connie and Scott, and it was just really cool back then. And so I became friends with Scott, and um, I kept telling him I wanted to go racing with him and yeah. asking him when I can go. And he's like, "Oh, your dad will never let you go racing." you know, you're going to be at that body shop for the rest of your life. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be at the body shop yeah. the rest of my life. Yeah. But, um, um, you know, I started going, doing some racing uh, with some alcohol funny car guys, uh, Frank Cook and Chuck Landers, uh, drag on charger alcohol funny car uh, in 1985 and um, 86. In 1987, I went to work um, helping a, a gentleman by the name of Jay Meyer on his alcohol dragster. And, uh, Jay taught me a lot about working on the cars. Um, it was, yeah. was interesting. He'd ask me, hey, do you know how to do the bottom end? And I'm like, no, I don't. He says, well, you're going to learn. Yeah. And so he would teach me. And uh, That's great. So yeah. Scott saw me out there more. Scott Coletta did. And, and he saw that I wanted to do this. And um, so finally one day I asked him, you know, 
hey, I, I want a job. And he says, well, I don't have an opening right now, but I'll let you know if we do. And of course, I'm thinking, yeah, that'll never happen. Yeah. But um, he called me up uh, about a week later. He says, hey, I have a spot if you're interested. And I was back in um, early 1988. It was in uh, February of 1988. And um, he says, uh, you know, meet me at the Texas Motorplex. You know, we're doing a, um, it was uh, the Coca-Cola Funny Car Classic back then. And so, um, you know, I helped him at that race and then um, uh, went, uh, my first national event, NHRA national event was the uh, Gator Nationals in 1988. So okay. I went over there and, yeah. you know, I just started working on these things and, um, you know, Scott um, was a, a, a great early mentor for me, you know, teaching me about working on a, you know, a nitro car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never thought that I would ever become a crew chief because you know back then I was 21 years old and I didn't think that that was a possibility because of all of the the great minds in drag racing back then you know yeah uh, Tim Richards Dale Armstrong and um, you know um, uh, Dale Emery you know the max stuff and, and there's uh, so many great crew chiefs and they're you know in my eyes I'm looking at these guys like they're just yeah, God gods, gods of the sport gods yeah of the sport sure. I'm just like a a peon starting out the sport, but, um, you know, fortunately for me, um, working around Connie and Scott was great for me, and then um, in 92, the end of the 92 season, uh, Connie made a move that changed a lot of motorsports forever, and he hired Dick LaHaye, mm -hmm. and uh, Dick LaHaye, in my opinion, is probably one of the greatest, um, you know, racers on a budget who can do the most with the least and he came aboard at Coletta's and changed everything yeah. and we went from being a team that where we were just happy to qualify and happy to you know man if we won like first round that was like winning a race yeah to all of a sudden now we're a team that we're going out and we're number one qualifiers we're, we're you know uh, winning rounds and then yeah. eventually we started winning races and um you know, I really decided, I said, you know, I, I want to run one of these cars one of these days. And um, so I started paying attention to a lot more than what I used to. Right. And, and LaHaye, he really encouraged that uh, a lot out of all of us, uh, my brother included, he was on the team. And, um, you know, as time went on, um, Dick LaHaye left the team and Ed McCullough, Ed Ace McCullough became our crew chief. Same thing, just a outstanding guy you know legendary racer and and um you know very underrated in the in the sport in my opinion of, of how great he is not just as a driver but as a as a tuner as well mm -hmm. and um you know he was very open teaching us as well and you know at the end of the 99 season some things changed with the team uh the ace was no longer with with Colletta motorsports and connie Coletta came up to me and says uh well, what do you want to do in the sport? You know, and I've been in the sport for almost 12 years professionally right. at that time. Right. And um, I told Connie, I said, I want to be a crew chief someday. And he says, well, I want to teach you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. And um, the cool part back then was, I think I got a little bit of the version of Connie um, back in the 60s when he didn't have his you know, humongous worldwide sure. cargo service because Connie had sold his business in um, uh, 1997. And so in 2000, like he didn't have, you know, that monstrosity of yeah. a business. So yeah. he was like really focused on the race car and um, we did a lot of crazy stuff and it was neat, you know, how he would change camshafts or he'd want to change this, he changed that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm, like absorbing all of this and sometimes we'd have success and sometimes sure. we wouldn't but it was it was a great learning experience for me and um but then about a year later he he bought his his old company back and um you know because he says um you know i, I want to buy this company back you know so that way we can go race the right way because his mind was as we were a a um, 
a drag racing team that owned a worldwide air cargo company so it was mm -hmm. kind of fun back then yeah uh, listening to him and how he grew that business and it's an amazing oh business. sure i but bet yeah learned so much from him and then he you know he he put me in charge of his entire you know drag racing operation and i was a general manager and i was a uh, you know crew chief uh for doug coletta and then scott coletta and um we had hillary will for a little while and then um went back to running Doug Coletta's car and and um, you know I had a great experience you know there and um, but you know moving forward now you know with you know I, I came to uh, work with Clay Milliken in 2019 kind of in a, a consulting role um, with uh, Mike Clover their crew chief at the time and and um, you know it was a great experience you know for me it was um, you know a different experience because everything we had at Coletta's we had you know an abundance of and um so now it was you know the budget's a little different and all that but it was still a lot of fun yeah and working with clay was just you know fantastic and um last year um they brought me on board to tune their car you know full time to be the the crew chief on the car yeah and um it was great you know doug stringer he was the owner of the team and uh was fantastic to work with good guy uh, clay of course is clay you can't yeah i mean he's just yeah. one of the best guys you'll ever meet absolutely yep yeah. and um yeah and then rick ware he got into the picture in uh august last year and purchased the team and and um it's been awesome yeah and um you know rick is just a he's best way to describe he's like a little kid you know he just loves this drag racing part he loves racing period that's yeah. his whole life yeah but um, he told me, he says, look, I can't give you everything you had at Coletta's because, you know, we had a full-blown repair shop. We sure. had a, a CNC shop, chassis shop, whatever. But it's a different beast, yeah. Yeah, there's connections that we have here mm -hmm. in uh, Mooresville and, and Dennis with PME. That was like the first thing. And, and I, he said, I want you to go over and check his shop out and let me know what you think. And um, I came over here and I was just blown away yeah. with Dennis and, and all of his team that he has here because he has some really solid, like, experienced people. Absolutely, yeah. We we just took a tour of the shop, got to see it ourselves. It's yeah. uh, it's very very cool. Yes. Yeah, and it, and it's and it's um, you know, having these guys here to be able to help us maintain our our blocks, maintain our heads. Um, you know repair them and they're, and they're doing a fantastic job with all that and that's really taken our team you know to another level and yeah. uh it's uh and i think we're just starting you know dennis is uh, such a, a great guy and he's and he's very smart and then the people that he has here are very very smart and i think you know they're just going to keep taking us to another level so it's yeah it's kind of cool you know we're kind of spread out a little bit you know, we have our shop there, and we, you know, Andrew's building short blocks here at yep. PME. But it's, I'd rather do that here, um, with Dennis being here, and and uh, you know everybody else at PME. In case we have an issue, we're here, yep. and we can take care of it. But uh, yeah, it's exciting, you know, uh, working with Rick Ware and and um, being in this Mooresville area and seeing like. Boy, I tell you what, this Mooresville, Charlotte area, there is more racing-related stuff here than I've ever seen. And oh, absolutely! I've spent a lot of time in Indy as well, and I I think this place is is uh, head and shoulders above Indy yeah. or anywhere else in the country. Yeah, yeah. No, there's certainly a number of shops and uh, businesses involved in the sport, so it's it's cool to see. It's cool to drive around and see the different places. Yeah, and it's neat though. Yeah. Right now, we're the only top fuel car in the area and uh you know and, and we our, our engines definitely make the most noise out of anybody <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely so jim obviously got a lot of history in the sport um you know drag racing and now you're a crew chief with clay milliken's team talk a little bit about you know what your focus is on you know at the track on you know on race days you know what what are you you know trying to achieve you know, over the years, um, and the sport has changed so much, and, and there's some days I realize, you know, I'm 56 years old now, and I, I've been doing this for 
you know, 35 years and I've seen a lot of changes in the sport. Yeah. And um, for me as a crew chief, when I, when I first became a co-crew chief with Connie Coletta back in 2000, we didn't have so much data that we were looking at all the time and um, keeping track of all the time. So like, you know, we had our notebook, we'd go back like, okay, we ran it. Columbus, Ohio, and the density altitude was this, and this is what we had on for blower overdrive, and this is what we had on, you know, uh, for head gaskets. Yeah. You know, and our compression ratio was was such, and um, and we would just kind of go back to these notes, you know. Well, over time, like we've built like tune-up programs, we've built like um, models, you know, on on. Um, you know, like predictors on, you know, what we think we could run uh, with with the car based on like a track temperature or air conditions. And what we've done is we build these programs that take all this historical data we have and now we can pull up like, you know, information from a run we made last year or the year yeah, before. Right. And okay, this is where we we're at with our, our tune up number, or this is how we ran our clutch, or this was the air for that run. So I find myself now spending more time like looking at data. Yeah, um, very data driven, yeah. Yeah, uh, kind of coming up with predictions of what we're gonna run and then keeping track of that data. So I'm constantly like filling things out. And I also have my old school little notebook that I keep in my pocket with me when we're on the starting line because, yeah. you know, Sometimes you pull up in the staging lanes and it might be an hour before you run. Well, conditions can change. So you can have the air can change or the track warms up or cools mm -hmm. down or something happens to where having that little notebook you go back to to say like, okay, we, you know, at Bristol last year, we, yeah. you know, track got this warm and we did this or, you know, something like that. And um, so, you're constantly like thinking about what you can do with this race car and how much um, you can get out of it. You know, yeah. you try to get the best ET your car can possibly give you with whatever that racetrack surface is. Yeah. Um, what's allowed me to do that more, spend more time looking at data is, is the team I have behind me. So, you know, it all starts like my, my car chief, Jesse Snyder, he is a fantastic young man. And I think one of the, the future crew chiefs of this sport. Mm -hmm. um, he makes sure that the flow of working on the car is going right. So whether it's disassembling the engine after a run, putting it together um, before the next run, making sure all that's right. Uh, Dennis, he comes to the races with us. Yeah. And um, that's a huge help for me because he'll go out and he'll measure every rod bearing after every run and he'll give me a report of what the, the pistons look like and the rods look like and the spark plugs look like. Because those are all things that yeah. I used to do a while ago yep. when we were gathering so much data. Um, so it helps me out and to know like when Dennis comes in with a bearing report, you know, maybe number five bearing, we're working on it a little hard rod bearing. Yep. Um, well, maybe I need to pay attention to that, you know, with you know, maybe a little more fuel volume or if all the rod bearings don't look so good, well, maybe I have a little bit too much, you know, cylinder pressure in the end. So maybe I need to adjust the compression ratio or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's really helped me because, you know, having a strong team behind you like that, that could look and, and see everything that's going on and then report back to me, yeah. you know, an issue yeah. that, that uh, makes my life a lot easier and allows me to more, you know, focus on looking at data. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, certainly. There's sometimes like the the old school part of me, I want to get out there and work on the car. And um, by the time I think I might need to do that, these guys are already done. Yeah. Um, we had a race in uh, Chicago. We won first round and I hadn't even wrote the air conditions down because Rick Ware, he's excited, he's calling me, Clay's, Clay's like a, his own computer himself, <laughs> he downloads himself to me and 
and by the time I start like writing things down, Jesse's in, he's like, hey, we're ready for head gaskets for the next run. And I'm like, I haven't wrote anything down yet. Mm. So I'm like, I've got, I said, I've got to get faster at what I do because sure. these guys, they just keep getting faster and faster yeah. all the time. And, um, uh, but it's, you know, it's cool, you know, monitoring the, the weather. And then these cars are so sensitive to everything. You think about it, they make 11, 12,000 horsepower. And um, if you're off a little bit somewhere, you know, it could be the difference between running very slow um, or it's running hard and you're hurting parts. Sure. And uh, so you really have to pay attention to like everything that you have. And, you know, like in our trailer, like we have head gaskets, uh, copper head gaskets as thin as 50,000 thick all the way up to 125,000 thick in 1,000 increments. Yeah. And these cars are the compression ratio is very low compared to anything else. Uh, we run, you know, anywhere from like a 6.50 to 1 compression ratio up to um, like 7.10 mm -hmm. to 1, which would be like at Denver. Yeah. And everything in between. And if you miss your head gaskets by like two or three thousandths, um, that could be the difference between the car running really slow or potentially hurting itself and, yeah. and wanting to uh, do some damage. So right. it's... Um, well, it's always trying to do some damage, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they but yeah, are. They're you, just, don't, you don't want anything catastrophic. Yeah. No, they're, these things are animals and, and um, they're cool. They make, I told, uh, I was telling Dennis, I said, um, you know, like a cup car, I think they were, those cars make like 500 horsepower now. And I said, these things, sometimes if they're having a good or bad day, sitting on a start line they might just decide to make 500 more horsepower or they might make 500 less mm -hmm. and um they're just crazy and they're just fascinating machines you know yeah to to be able to go you know zero to 300 miles an hour in less than three seconds mm -hmm. is pretty impressive and then you know make a, a thousand foot run and do that and you know three point you know six five seconds at 335 miles an hour yes yeah absolutely amazing to me it's insane for sure yeah. yeah so jim on that note looking at the future of the sport you know i know there's and, and you're you'd be able to correct me but there's now challenges to get to certain speeds or a certain time um you know a little extra cash if, if a team does it but you know what what's the future of the sport you know where do you see it going from the engine standpoint and you know out there on the track well i know we're you know nhra um uh, handcuffs us some mm -hmm. um, because if they just like if we were just able to do whatever we wanted to do uh, it'd be hard for them to police all of that and yeah. you know we could build something and we could go run you know 340 plus miles an hour at a thousand foot but there's so many other things that have to go along with that so you know we uh, the teams in NHRA work very closely with Goodyear the tires uh, to make sure that the tires are mm -hmm. are safe, you know, traveling at those speeds. Um, you know, the uh, the racetracks themselves, you know, uh, the, the prep on them, you know, yep. we don't have like the the crazy prep that, you know, maybe some of like the, the outlaw stuff does or the, I think it's the, the radial stuff, you mm -hmm. know, they have tracks yeah. you can't even walk on. So, you know, the NHRA does a good job in keeping that in check and, and we don't necessarily want tracks that grippy right um you know because that's uh not good for for things mm. all the time i mean yeah. yeah it would be cool if that was if we had these awesome racetracks all the time but it does yeah. make it you know a little more challenging but you know i think like the future of the sport um i think it's it's good um <laughs> there's been a lot more excitement about um NHRA, you know, the past couple of years, especially in the Nitro ranks. Yeah. Um, what we need is we just need more cars, more competitors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to back in the 70s, you might have 30 top fuel cars show up for a 16 car field. Well, yeah. you don't have that anymore. And a lot of it is because of finances. You know, the sport costs a lot more than yeah. what it did back then. 
Um, you know, we need young people in the, in the sport as well. So, you know, NHRA, you know, and the, and the race teams, we're trying to do things to encourage young people to get in the sport. We're trying to do things to um, encourage sponsors to get involved with us. I think it's great that um, Rick Ware owns the team and, you know, he's so involved with NASCAR and he has an Indy car. So he, you know, he understands all facets of racing. Yeah. And I think somebody like Rick is going to be able to introduce drag racing to people that may not have seen it any, you know, yeah. in the past. Yeah. Uh, Tony Stewart, the same way. You mm. know, I think having him in our sport has been huge. Yeah, you get a um, different fan base involved a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah and, and he's driving himself in the in a, a fuel dragster, and he's yeah. been successful with that. And I think that's that's big. You know, it puts more eyes on our sport. So, you know, I'm I'm encouraged that you know we've got a good future in the sport. Um, it's just going to take you know getting us in front of the people that can help pay the bills because you know these things you know don't run on uh, yeah. anything but cash yeah. and um, you know and and you need that to just you know make it to the next race you know and, and have the parts you need you yeah. know yeah. you want to to be competitive and you know be a top 10 car so you know I think I think it's good you know I'm, I'm excited about it I think you know engine development stuff is um, a little bit stagnant with that right now and that's more of NHRA just keeping us in yeah. check Right. And, um, but we figured out other ways to like overcome certain things. And, yeah. and I think it's, it's made a lot of us, uh, crew chiefs, like think more about the engines and, and, you know, whether it's camshaft design or yeah. how you run your fuel system or how you run your clutch. Yeah. Um, things like that that are going to help, help you pick up a little bit, you know, here and there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the days of like, the, the innovation like you know Big Daddy Don Garlitz or Connie Clett or whatever that's I think some of that stuff's going to be hard to come by down the road but sure. it's, it's going to be those little bitty things that are going to make a big difference for yeah. us in the future yeah well I know I'm excited to to wa keep watching and uh, see where it goes and Jim I wanted to say thanks for giving us some time and Absolutely, uh, you know good luck the rest of the season out there with Clay and, and the rest of your team so Guys, we appreciate you guys watching this uh, episode here with Jim Oberhofer of uh, Clay Milliken's Top Fuel Drag Team. And uh, make sure you guys are checking out Rick Ware Racing and following along uh, with Clay and what he's been up to uh, week in and week out. And as always, make sure you're checking out EngineBuilderMag.com for more engine content. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.